This is QTV News. I am Maria Tusilibe and thanks for joining us. First, the main local, international and sports news headlines. President Barrow on Wednesday made surprise visits to some government institutions to interact with staff and see for himself the working conditions of public officers. Stakeholders in the tourism industry have expressed concern over the lack of tourists for this year's tourist season. A 10-day cyber security awareness training course for IT personnel ended on Wednesday at the Pura head office. A validation workshop for stakeholders on the legislative gaps assessment on a project titled Addressing Conflict Over Land and Natural Resources in the Gambia was held on Wednesday. In international news, after months of campaigning, acrimony and finally voting, America's presidential election result hangs in the balance. Ethiopia's Prime Minister Ahmed on Wednesday ordered the military to confront the country's Tigray regional government after he said it carried out a deadly attack on a military base causing fatalities. In sports, Argentine football legend and World Cup winner Diego Maradona is in hospital in his native Argentina following surgery to remove a blood clot from his brain. And Africa has strong representation in the men's and women's shortlist for the World Athletes of the Year. Now, the local news in detail. <music> President Barrow on Wednesday made surprise visits to some government institutions to interact with staff and see for himself the working conditions of public officers. As Alusisa reports, the president observed that many public officers are in the habit of reporting to work late and the president advocated for behavioral change. The unannounced visits come exactly a week since the Secretary General and Head of the Civil Service, Noha Toure, issued a memo to all government agencies and departments regarding public officers reporting to work late and leaving office before official closing times. In that memo, it was stated that the president will embark on surprise visits and that was exactly what happened on Wednesday morning when President Barrow visited the quadrangle which houses many ministries, departments and agencies. The president's visits was meant to give him an opportunity to see for himself the working conditions of public officers and to interact with them to know their challenges with a view to addressing them gradually. While encouraging them to be committed to their work for the progress and development of the country, he assured them of his commitment to a well-motivated civil service despite existing challenges. The president expressed dissatisfaction with the attitude of many public officers who will not only report to work late but leave for home well before the official closing time at 4 p.m., which was 6 p.m. under the previous government. He urged heads of institutions to lead by example by ensuring that they report to work on time and stay to the official closing time. Information is 3 o'clock. Every civil service will be going on. And I'm closing time is 4 o'clock. Before I came to power, it was increased to 6. Mm -hmm. Even by first people have to stay there. Mm -hmm. to 6 o'clock. <laughs> yes. Now, we brought it down to 4 o'clock. It was still this abuse. The private sector, they are succeeding because they respect their working hours. And they work. That's what you are paid for. You cannot be busy more than what you are paid for. This visit is expected to serve as a wake-up call to other government institutions to expect an unexpected high-profile guest at any time, and that it won't be business as usual. Reporting for QTV News, I am Alou Sisse. A 10-day cyber security awareness training course for IT personnel ended on Wednesday at the Pura head office. The training brought about 40 participants from different institutions to increase their knowledge on the application of technologies processes and controls to protect systems, networks, programs, devices and data from cyber attacks. The training was organized by Pura in collaboration with the World Bank. Cyber security had and continues to be an increasingly important issue for the world, hence the need for such training. Solo Sima, the Director of Consumer Affairs, on behalf of Pura's Director General, hopes that such training will create a safe and secure cyberspace for users against unwary but serious threats. We are sure that implementing some of the skills learned and applied positively will immediately yield positive impact in our various institutions. A continued collaboration among yourselves as the first batch of experts CNIIs, 
cybersecurity experts will definitely stand you in a good step. With the ultimate goal of securing the national digital space, it is inherent data and, res and resident infrastructure, we urge you to remain on track whilst we work towards enhancing our collective skills further for the security and benefit of the Gambia. Nicholas Jata, Director ICT at Pura, says the training was timely given the rise in cyber attacks coupled with efforts to contain the COVID-19. In the wake of the coronavirus situation presents an opportunity for economic development as well as risks for cyber criminals. However, I am confident that this, with this training given to you all, as administrators of critical network infrastructures, you are better prepared to tackle the ever-increasing threats of cybersecurity. I have no doubt that you will be able to be extra motivated to implement strong disaster recovery business continuity plans for your various organizations. For Amadouba, a consultant, the evolution of the increased use of cyber technologies means to advise the need for every country to ensure secure information systems against external threats. Cyber security is the order of the day. We all know data is the new oil. Now you don't hear about oil, you don't hear about you know, gas, you don't hear about petrol. You know, what we hear, the order of the day today is data. And because data is very, very critical in our national development process, uh, Pura feel it fitting to, to, to also support the government in its endeavor to set up uh, what we call a computer security incident response team in this country. It's a very, very big need for this country as far as cyber security is concerned. On behalf of the participants, Bakiba Buso, head of Interpol in the Gambia, while acknowledging that the training has greatly increased their skills, appeals for more training of this sort. Preventing and combating new emerging crimes is a challenging task. While organized criminals or crimes have been of major concern for the past two decades, other forms of criminal activities are now coming to the fore. In January this year, the Security Forum identified the three top cybersecurity threats as the race for global technology dominance, the increased use of cloud digital technology, and thirdly, cybercrime. The ceremony wrapped up with the issuance of certificates to the participants for successfully completing the training. Reporting for QTV News, I am Alou Sisse. Stakeholders in the tourism industry have expressed concern over the lack of tourists for this year's tourist season following the reopening of the airport, hotels and restaurants. QTV's Antsumana Iswenyasi reports. In all sectors, one of the Gambia's main economic drivers, tourism is facing its worst challenge in recent times. After reopening after eight months closer, most of the hotels, restaurants and tourist attractions remain empty. And despite government rolling out monetary and fiscal stimulus to key actors in the industry, the tourism sector is still reeling from the impact of COVID-19. Acting chairman of the Gambia Hotel Association, Jim Johansen, says the current situation could be attributed to many factors, including some key tour operators cancelling all flights to Gambia as Europe experiences a second wave of coronavirus. The major tour operators, one gone bust, one pulling out, uh, one already declaring that they're not coming the entire season and and some have not started their operation yet it looks like well at least this side of christmas we are not going to see much i think in this hotel we have i, th I think a f total of five rooms booked for christmas that's all and normally at christmas we're full so that that gives an indication of the hotel owners are not the only ones affected Taxi drivers used to operating around the tourism development area have also been hit hard. On a regular day, this deserted garage would host over 200 taxi drivers. However, since March this year, almost all of them remain unemployed and hopeless. Baba Sise, the former president of the Tourist Taxi Drivers Association, and Abdullahi Bah, a tourist taxi driver, expressed their dismay at what they describe as a bad season. They are calling on government to provide them with more support and also urge the tourism minister to visit and talk to them for an opportunity to know and address their concerns. Well, 
decision well we have information decisions it should start uh, October but still for me the sign I'm seeing uh, I'm not convinced season is not happening all thing is going the way we know to season every November no driver is staying here we all are in excursions to Georgetown Tendaba camp Basse Ten Jufre or to Northern Senegal, Fatala Park, or South Gambia. But November, this time of the year, you know, tourists, no tourists are here. And you are not seeing any drivers coming. Everybody is thinking what to do. But nothing, nothing. Modu Peter Maas is a tour guide who has been working in the industry for many years. Ask what he makes of the tourism season this year. This is what he has to say. It's very difficult here because we don't have no work, number one. Uh, we don't go nowhere because of this coronavirus and uh, also um, it's very tough for us because it's all coming to be about six to eight months now we don't have no work so um, we are expecting anyway for hope is expecting for 2021 hopefully when 2021 is approached we are expecting to resume back to the work yes some of our challenges, uh, well, um, it's very difficult. The World Travel and Tourism Council, WTTC, has drawn up what it says is a five-point plan to avoid a worst-case scenario. This involves removal and replacement of any quarantine measures, adoption of global health safety protocols, implementation of a rapid test and trace strategy, greater collaboration between the public and private sectors, and finally, continued government support for the sector in terms of fiscal and liquidity incentives, as well as measures to protect workers. The latter point will certainly resonate with many in the sector in the Gambia. Tourism is an important income provider for tens of thousands of people in the Gambia, with COVID-19 cases still rife in most of Europe, especially in countries where most of our tourists come from. Stakeholders within the industry say they are expecting a mega season. It remains to be seen whether the methods suggested by the WTTC can and will be adopted by the Gambia and whether this will make the required difference. And Swane Soinyasi for KTV News. A validation workshop for stakeholders on the legislative gaps assessment on a project titled Addressing Conflict Over Land and Natural Resources in the Gambia was held on Wednesday. The project aims to strengthen government's efforts in formulating legal frameworks for land and natural resources. Momorika Jaga reports. As part of efforts to adjust the current legal framework governing land and natural resources in the country, a gap assessment was carried out to review the existing relevant legislation and policy document on land and natural resource management. The assessment recommended the provision in law for legal aid assistance to those who cannot afford the services of legal representation in land disputes. It also recommended that the Commission for Civic Education be empowered to undertake civic education on citizens' rights. The purpose of this very important exercise is to address major challenges in, government, in governance of land tenure, forests and other natural resources in the Gambia. The key challenge include inadequate legal frameworks and poor enforcement of existing laws and regulations, different normative frameworks including common law, Islamic law, and customary law, as well as limitations of land administration institutions. Although there are provisions in the 1997 constitution guaranteeing land ownership by both men and women in equal share of inheritance land, there appears to be gaps indicating discrimination against women and children, especially on inheritance, according to this assessment. It is therefore recommended that a family code and or an interstate succession law be introduced to correct the gap in the provisions of Women's Act 2010. The provision should also be amended to read our sons and daughters instead of a man and a woman to ensure that children are not discriminated against. I'm uh, 
One of the issues that have been said is most of the laws do not actually accommodate women's rights. And these are certain things that we are like bringing in board to ensure everyone is protected and all every citizen is like accommodated and it protects the rights of every individual. Usman Yabo, the executive director of Tango, speaking on behalf of the civil society organization, says land issues are sensitive and an assessment of a legal framework is timely. He also says that there are dangers in land conflicts which need to be addressed. We are all aware of the dangers in land conflicts and natural resources. So as the need to develop policies, laws, to guide us as to how to handle this sensitive but very important sector in our economy. This project is supported by the United Nations Peace Building Fund in collaboration with the FAO and the Ministry of Lands and Regional Government. Mustafa Sise, head of programs at the FAO, says the aim is to foster peace and conflict resolution, which is an objective of the United Nations. Through your efforts, ladies and gentlemen, leaders, policymakers, communities, and individuals will be provided with the requisite knowledge and information to prevent future conflicts over land and natural resources. We hope that the document that we are validating will systematically be considered by all stakeholders and used by government as a guide to review existing frameworks and uh, to adopt new legislation to mitigate conflicts and modernize the land management laws. In much of Africa, women do not have equal inheritance rights. Under customary law across many African countries, when a man dies, it is his adult sons and sometimes his brothers who are entitled to his property at the expense of his daughters. Women's rights to land and decent housing are part of the fundamental rights enshrined in numerous international legal instruments, namely the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, to which the Gambia is a signatory. When the declaration was proclaimed in 1948, Saudi Arabia was the sole abstainer on the declaration among Muslim nations, claiming that it violated Sharia law. Pakistan, officially an Islamic republic, signed the declaration and critiqued the Saudi position. Since then, most countries have signed but not implemented this aspect of the declaration. Mumutu Gajaga, QTV News. We will go for a short commercial break and when we come back, the news continues with some more local news stories. Do stay tuned. The Gambia may be the smallest country in Africa, but it will host the second largest gathering of world leaders in 2022 to successfully host the OIC summit and put the Gambia on the global stage, the government of the Gambia set up OIC Gambia to mobilize resources for the implementation of key development and infrastructure projects on a scale never seen before. 20 new roads will be constructed across the country and the Bertel Harding Highway will be expanded into a dual carriage highway of two lanes on each side from the airport to Sting Corner. All people in the Gambia deserve clean water and a constant flow of electricity. Therefore, an entirely new water system will be constructed, including new transmission and distribution networks to meet the increasing demand. In order to provide a more reliable supply of electricity, the OIC Gambia project will replace and double the capacity of the Nawak transformers and overhead electric cables. We will equip the police with modern apparatus and technical training in an effort to keep the streets of the Gambia safe. By building the largest international conference center in the region, a five-star hotel with state-of-the-art facilities, first-class mobility services, and improving the VVIP experience at the Banjul International Airport, OIC Gambia will position the Gambia as the leading conference destination in West Africa. With our partners in the tourism sector, we will reinforce the preeminent position of our nation, the Smiling Coast, as a go-to destination. The OIC Gambia will create strategic partnerships that calls for the involvement of local talent and businesses as a matter of requirement. In short, OIC Gambia projects will create jobs, boost commerce, accelerate growth, improve the urban outlook and lifestyles of many families across the Gambia. So let's support the OIC Gambia as it prepares us for one of the biggest global events, 
OIC Gambia, building today for a better tomorrow. Welcome back. A four days cooking competition is underway at the Gambia YMCA's Learning and Skills Center for students studying catering and hotel management. This story by Loli M. Kamara is narrated by Jane Basonko. The competition aims to encourage students to be independent, self employable, and self reliant. 123 students are currently taking part after nine months of training in catering and hotel management. The winners stand a chance of winning $80,000 worth of catering materials as a business startup. The judges for the competition are drawn from the Gambia Chefs Association. The head of YMCA Youth Empowerment Skill Training Center, Idris Ajiba, highlights the importance of the training. Even if you want to become a housekeeper, you have to learn how to cook as well. So some of them are going to be receptionists, some are housekeepers, some are cooks, some are waiters and waitress. So we will send them for attachment, and the attachment will last for three months. The president of the Gambia Chefs Association, Seku Bojang, says despite COVID-19, the competition is still going ahead, and this will help students to be better prepared for business after graduation. Every single one here today is a potential business person who may run their own restaurant or hotel, maybe, who knows. But how would they build their finances based on their production in food? Um, we need to look into the, the, being resourceful as to how to source their ingredients. You need to uh, know about that. Uh, the originality of your dishes, because that's what makes you original, authentic, and people will always come to you because of that originality. They wouldn't get it anywhere else. That's your signature. And then we go into your hygiene. That's the methodologies involved when you're preparing the dish, whether you groomed well, your, 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 your cleanliness, and the way you organize yourself, compose yourself before your meal has been prepared. Because that's very important, because when a meal is prepared behind scene, no one gets to see it. But what it takes to get to that level, I mean, and then someone having to consume it and get sickness out of it, is really, really a key thing that we need to look into. So meaning we have to be really careful of what we eat and then where we eat. Mustafa Sanyang, a student, is confident of winning, saying it will help save his future as the coronavirus has affected everyone. We did not cover all of our topics that enough, you know, but unfortunately we have tried our best. The National Council of the Gambia YMCA is a non-governmental organization that caters for young people, empowering them in skills training to develop them to be productive citizens. The event was also attended by parents, guardians and loved ones. Antoine Esonyasi, Foki TV News. We will take another short break and we continue with international and sports news when we return. Your favorite QSAL service has gotten bigger. e Kanta. Now you can loan bigger credit amounts to make life easier for you, loan $75 C and $100 C and pay later. Yes, you heard me right. Get credit loan from $10 C to $100 C using Ifa Kanta by dialing star 393 hash. Anytime you run out of credit, whether you want to buy Q Power, browse the internet, make urgent calls, or send SMS, Ifa Kanta is the service for you. Dial star 393 hash and choose the loan amount of your choice with no hassle. For more information, call our customer care on 111. QSEL, Sunyabus, the pioneers of mobile loan service in the Gambia. We innovate, others follow. Terms and conditions apply. Welcome back. In international news, the November 3rd U.S. presidential election has ended with votes counted from over 40 states so far showing the Democratic candidate Joe Biden with a narrow margin lead in the race to the White House. Meanwhile, President Trump has claimed victory after citing irregularities into the voting process and announced an intention to contest the results at the Supreme Court. Momodo Lamin Choi reports. Polls in the U.S. highest voter turnout in a century have closed, and counting has begun. Before the time of this broadcast, 42 of the 50 states had finished counting their results, showing Joe Biden carrying more popular votes as well as electoral college votes than President Trump. However, it is not the popular votes that elects a president in the U.S. 
a presidential candidate needs 270 electoral college votes to be declared a winner. As vote counting continues in the battleground states, preliminary results show the result on a knife edge. According to these preliminary and exit polls by the BBC, Joe Biden is leading in the electoral college votes with a narrow margin of 14 votes. As we went on air, all eyes are turned to the eight states where vote counting continues and results from these states will decide who will occupy the White House for the next four years. Addressing supporters, Biden said he believes he is on track to win. He flipped Arizona, meaning the state had gone to the Republican candidate in the previous election, while taking California, Washington, New York and Illinois. In a dramatic move while vote counting continues in the key states, Trump confusingly both claimed a premature victory and then alleged they had lost it as there has been voter fraud without citing any evidence. He then threatened to challenge the continuing counts of mail ballots in the U.S. Supreme Court, although according to the electoral law experts, the legal grounds under which he will do this are not clear. In reaction to President Trump's victory claim, Joe Biden has called for patience while the remaining votes are being counted. Already, a sharp division among U.S. citizens has been created and there is a genuine threat of looming post-electoral violence in the coming days after the final results are announced if either side is not happy with the result. Mohamed Lamin Choi TV News. Ethiopia's Prime Minister Ahmed on Wednesday ordered the military to confront the country's Tigray regional government after he said it carried out a deadly attack on a military base that resulted in many deaths, injuries and property damage. Omar Pijalo has more. The statement by the Prime Minister Abiy Ahmed's office and the reported attack by the well-armed Tigray People's Liberation Front has raised concerns that one of Africa's most populous and peaceful countries could plunge back into war. Tensions between the government and TPLF, which used to be part of the governing coalition before falling out with Mr. Abiy, have escalated in recent months, with both sides accusing the order of plotting to use military force. A statement from the Prime Minister's office said, this situation has reached a level where it cannot be prevented and controlled through the regular law enforcement mechanisms. Mr. Abiy, who was awarded the Nobel Peace Prize in 2019, is facing increasing criticism from a number of sides, with some accusing him of locking up those who oppose his government. The last deadly war in the country was between Ethiopia and Eritrea from May 1998 to June 2000, with the final peace only agreed to in 2018, 20 years after the initial confrontation. It was this that helped Mr. Ahmed get the Nobel Peace Prize. Ethiopian's cabinet had declared a state of emergency in the region for six months, saying that illegal and violent activities within the national regional state of Tigray are endangering public peace and security and threatening the country's sovereignty. The authorities have also shut down telephones and internet service in Tigray. Mr. Abiy said that attackers tried to loot military assets during Wednesday's attack, adding that the last red line had been crossed. In September, people in Tigray voted in a local parliamentary election in defiance of the federal government and the electoral board decision to postpone all elections due to the coronavirus pandemic. The federal government has described the vote as illegal. On Sunday, a senior TPLF official told reporters that his side will not accept a negotiation with the federal government, adding that what they need now is national dialogue, not negotiation. He said the release of detained former officials is one of preconditions to opening talks. The Ethiopian war will be the worst possible outcome of the tensions that have been brewing. If the international community fails to rally around the idea of national dialogue, given Tigray's relatively strong security position, the conflict may also be prolonged and disastrous. Reporting for KTV News, I am Omar P. Jallo. In sports. Argentine football legend and World Cup winner Diego Maradona, regarded by many as the greatest player of all time, is in hospital in his native Argentina following surgery to remove a blood clot from his brain. More in this report. The brain surgery was conducted in a private clinic in Buenos Aires, a day after he was admitted to a hospital suffering from anemia and dehydration. 
Maradona's supporters with banners showing his face collected outside the clinic. The football legend had a troubled and public medical history. Maradona was admitted to hospital in January 2019 with internal bleeding in the stomach and also fell ill at the 2018 World Cup in Russia during a game between Argentina and Nigeria. The legend who celebrated his 60th birthday on October 30th, a week after Brazil legend Pele celebrated his 80th birthday, is regarded as one of the greatest football players ever to have played the game. He rose to prominence as Argentino's genius before a spell at rivals Boca Juniors, which earned him superstardom and a move to Barcelona in 1982. He joined Napoli two years later and helped the club win their first ever Serie A title in 1987 and again in 1990. It was during his spell with Napoli that Maradona led Argentina to World Cup glory in 1986. He scored one of the greatest goals of all times against England in the quarterfinals, along with the infamous Han of God. A goal he once described was scored by divine intervention in an interview. His five goals and five assists at the Mexico 1986 World Cup earned him the tournament's best player award. And while he did not find the target in the final, he created the winning goal, George Buruchaga. Argentina came up short in the defense of their title at the 1990 World Cup, including losing to Cameroon in the first match of Italia 90. Nonetheless, they made it through the final, losing to Germany, who scored a 58-minute penalty. At the 1994 World Cup, Maradona was sent home in disgrace after failing a drugs test after Argentina's 2 all draw with Nigeria. Omudu Gajaga, QTV News. The shortlists have been announced for the Men's and Women's World Athlete of the Year Award 2020. Yet again, there is a strong representation from Africa. More in this report. For Africa, the most eye-catching element of the 10-person shortlist is that in both the men's and women's category, five of those up for the coveted award are from Africa, all of whom are track athletes. In the women's list of 10, remarkably, one field athlete makes the list. Venezuela's long jump superstar Yulima Rojas. In the women's category, the full list of nominees are Femke Ball of Netherlands, Lesson Bert Gide of Ethiopia, Sifan Hashan of the Netherlands, Pires Jepchichir of Kenya, Fade Capigon of Kenya, Laura Mir Great Britain, Helen Obiri of Kenya, Yulima Rojas, Venezuela, Ellen Thompson Hera, Jamaica, Ababel Yashane, Ethiopia. On the men's shortlist, three of the five Africans in the final ten are from Kenya and the other two are from Ethiopia. Unlike the women's list, more field athletes are featured with two representatives from Discourse, one from Javelin, one shot putter, one discourse thrower, and one pole vaulter. The full list of male nominees are Donovan Brazier of the USA, Joshua Chaptege, Uganda, Timothy Chariot, Kenya, Ryan Kusha of the USA, and Mondo Duplantis of Sweden, Jacob Kiplimo, Uganda, Noah Lies, USA, Daniel Stahl, Sweden, Johannes Vetter of Germany, and Karsten Vahom of Norway. The award is the most prestigious award given away from any actual competition. The previous winners include Yushan Bolt, who won the men's award on six occasions, and Kenya's Eliud Chipcock, who won in 2018 and 2019. Notable multiple winners of the women's award include Russia's Yelena Ishanbayeva, who scooped the award on three occasions, and Marion Jones, who won it twice. The male and female World Athletes of the Year will be announced live at the World Athletics Awards 2020 on Saturday, 5th December. And so on, so on, so on, so on, so on. Before we end this bulletin, let's take a quick look at our main stories. President Barrow on Wednesday made surprise visits to some government institutions to interact with staff and see for himself the working conditions of public officers. Stakeholders in the tourism industry have expressed concern over the lack of tourists for this year's tourist season. A 10-day cyber security awareness training course for IT personnel ended on Wednesday at the Pura head office. A validation workshop for stakeholders on the legislative gaps assessment on a project titled Addressing Conflict over Land and Natural Resources in the Gambia was held on Wednesday. In international news, 
Ethiopia's Prime Minister Ahmed on Wednesday ordered the military to confront the country's Tigray regional government after he said it carried out a deadly attack on a military base causing fatalities. In sports. Argentine football legend and World Cup winner Diego Maradona is in hospital in his native Argentina following surgery to remove a blood clot from his brain. And Africa has strong representation in the men's and women's shortlist for World at least of the Year. That's all we have for you in this bulletin of the news. Join us at 10 for another bulletin. Thank you for watching.